on Mary Igbazua. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for honoring our invitation to this very um, great occasion for the official project launch of the uh, Women and Youth for Peace COVID-19 initiative in Adamawa State, an EU-funded project in partnership with the British Council under the Managing Conflict in Nigeria project. Um, I want to start by apologizing once more for the delay in starting on time. I understand that the weather conditions today might have affected um, the ability of, of, of um, guests to get here in time. However, we're happy to see you, and as the MC, MC said, mentioned earlier, it was to be a very um, interactive breakfast uh, meeting where we explain the project and call on our stakeholders present here today to key into the project and lend us our, um, their support in making sure that we can successfully implement this project across all the six local governments here in Adamawa states that is going to be implemented. Uh, on behalf of the hub, I want to thank um, the hub and the foundation. I want to thank the British Council, ably represented here um, by Mr. Abdul Kadir, for the opportunity given to the HIF Foundation to um, be an implementing partner, working with stakeholders as yourself here, implementing the project in Adamawa State. The, um, a little bit about the, the project. The inclusion of women and youth in, um, in COVID-19 initiative is actually built on the premise, whereas for the past um, uh, six to nine months, the whole world was put down in turmoil as nations struggled to address the changes, of, um, the changes that happened and the challenges faced in COVID-19. For us specifically here in the Northeast in Adamawa State, for instance, we were again tackled with another challenge. While the Northeast in the past 10 years has been working towards addressing the issues of insurgency and the ripple effect it's had on socioeconomic um, framework of the Northeast, we now had another challenge to address. How can we start thinking our ways out of these issues? We have people still in IDP camps. We still have about a, a million plus people displaced across the Bay states of Borno, Adamo, and Yobe. We have people that are living in conditions where a pandemic like COVID-19 could pose a threat. So the immediate effect of the Adamawa state and other states um, in the Northeast was um, putting together the preparedness and response strategy to address COVID-19. So we now thought about it as an innovation space. How can we lend our support? What can we do to involve women and youth in these um, conversations and in the, uh, in, in, in the problem solving process? Because we understand that as a pandemic, it affects every aspect of it. And women and youth are usually the most vulnerable in situations of humanitarian um, um, challenges. So we said, to solve these problems, we have to carry women and youth along the way. And that is a principle that is strongly held by the British Council as well and uh, um, through the EU-funded project on that MCN. So today we're here to officially launch the project, which is set to go through six local governments here in Adamawa State working with women and youth groups, primarily to create solutions, to hear back from members of the community, and how best to continue the messaging on prevention of um, the spread of the pandemic. As the MC said, we might feel like COVID-19 is a thing of the past, it's gone now. But for every humanitarian challenge or crisis or health pandemic, what we need to do is look at the lessons learned and see what ch um, changes we can make and better prepare to respond to crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic was an opportunity for nations to look within, to see the breaks in our health system, to see the cracks in our response strategy for pandemics that most nations were not prepared to address. For us here in Nigeria, it was an opportunity to rise again, and Africa, if I may say, to defeat another pandemic or um, um, disease outbreak as we did in the um, Ebola crisis. And we're proud to see how actors in the humanitarian field within the government, CSOs, health ministries and health um, um, commissions were able to rise up to the challenge. It was a community effort. And for us to continue to see that we are able to completely stamp out the corona outbreak here in Nigeria and find solutions to lasting community health, we have to continue to work together and collaborate. And that's why we're all gathered here to launch this project officially. In the last two months, the project team had begun to do stakeholder uh, mapping across Adamawa State. You might have received members of our team visiting you in your local government areas, in your offices, and trying to explain what the project is about. And our hope is that at the end of this, 
we would have identified women and youth groups that are partners in sending this message of COVID-19 across Adamawa states. We are focusing on six local governments, but because we believe that for any innovative solution to take impact, you have to start with a sample. And then through the experience and then the learnings from working with that sample, they now step down their learnings to further local government areas. So while we are just limited to six, our belief is that 21 local governments in Adamawa state would receive the exact same messaging through collaboration and community engagement on how best to prepare and also report cases of um, COVID-19 and also infectious disease outbreak. So we're going to have three main areas of focus. The Youth Innovation Challenge, where we're going to have youth groups that will participate in the Innovation Challenge pr um, program, submitting their solutions to the effects, um, to, the, to the issues they've realized in their communities to COVID-19. These youth groups will go through a complete process of innovation and innovative design thinking process, where they'll be here at you know, our innovation campus and then reaching out to stakeholders like yourself and experts in different fields from security to health to community peace and development. We come up with a program that will train them this period, help them work through their solutions and begin implementation in their community. The top six groups that we'll be working with will receive seed funding to help them to be able to implement and scale these solutions. Because everything we do, we always try to think about how viable is it in the future? How can we sustain beyond just the funding received from the British Council and EU fund? How can they learn this entrepreneurial and, and um, innovative um, skill set and also humanitarian innovation to continue to implement even post the project? That's why they receive this seed funding and training. A similar approach is going to be used for the women groups, girls groups, whereas I identify the role of women in society as a central point and a figurehead in always uh, in educating our communities, our children, and also in keeping the, for, um, the family structure um, solid even during the crisis period. So we'll be working with women groups to also go through the process of communicating the process of disease control, public health awareness, and then using these women groups as um, campaign ambassadors that will go out into the communities to further spread the messaging. COVID-19 isn't over. There's still a lot to be done. And we're happy that at this point, we're starting this project and also recognizing the efforts already um, carried out by members within the humanitarian development and also the uh, state governments and also CSOs in terms of addressing COVID-19 challenge in Adamawa State. And that's why we're calling all of you here together to see what has happened, what are the lessons you've learned, and how can we learn from that and also make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel, but instead we're thinking of design thinking from the approach of where can we go in terms of skill. Another issue that um, the MCN project tries to um, advocate for is peace, peace and justice. And in the case of the Sheila Boys crisis that has um, sprung up here in Adamawa State, we also want to understand what's the impact on the COVID-19 um, pandemic here in the, in the community. How did the lockdown affect the economic framework of the state? Did people lose their jobs? Did crime rates go up? Do we have more cases of sexually based violence? Do we have more cases of crime in the community? How can we solve the issues of Sheila Boys, peace and justice, working with security forces? Because we believe that the, uh, for peace to, to, to reign, justice has to be served. So while we address these challenges, we want to make sure that we're working with subject matter experts in the human, in humanitarian sector, peace and justice sector, to find lasting solutions to this Sheila crisis. So working once more with youth groups and security agencies, we will have interactive sessions with them, come up with solutions, and most importantly, try to think of psychosocial support to address, to address the issues that um, break down the structures of community that lead to youth restiveness and rising crime. These are some of the ways we are hoping to address this, and we hope that with the interactive conversation, we'll come up with more solutions, learn more, because we believe that whenever we have people like yourself gathered in the room, it's a period of knowledge sharing. So we really want to encourage everyone to please participate we are socially distanced, but let's not be socially distanced in our communication. So please feel relaxed. It's going to be as informal, formal as possible, where we want to hear back from you, share what our concept is for the program, and most especially collaborate to ensure that we can successfully implement this project in Adama. We always want to make sure that while working in the Northeast, 
those of us based here in the Nadama chapter in Northeastern State always um, be like the pace setters. And then whatever we are able to implement here successfully can be scaled across the region. So please, thank you so much for being here and thank you for your patience. Let's have a very interactive session. And the MC will do a great job of coordinating questions, answers, also sharing our experiences so far. So for leaders present, for women leaders present, for people present from the humanitarian development sector, the government, private sector, CSOs, please let's talk, to, talk with one another, share these experiences, learn from what, each other, and we hope that when the um, Cardio comes to share more about the um, British Council MCN project, we will see where the vision of this is going. Thank you very much. The representative of police, representative of uh, the Honorable Premiership, representatives of the Atiku Center, our keynote speaker, my colleagues from the MCN program, um, representatives of women and youth groups. Good morning. I'm pleased to in for my national program manager, Sir Mohammed Tabi USAN, to deliver a keynote remarks. The MCN program is happy to partner with Humanitarian Innovation Hub to deliver this project. The MCN program is a four-year European Union funded program. And uh, MCN is managing conflict in Nigeria program. We are in, in Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe states. And we've carried out a lot of activities for the past four years. We are in our fourth year now uh, through conflict management, reconciliation activities, reintegration activities, women empowerment, uh, as well as supporting research. We've done that through supporting a lot of uh, initiatives towards building capacities of traditional rulers in mediation in our communities. Um, we have trained over 600 traditional rulers in Adamar Emirate, in Mubi Emirate, Ganya Traditional Council, as well as Bachama Traditional Council. And with the support of these traditional institutions, we've established what the Sulhu centers in these four locations, where all mediation activities carried out by traditional rulers are recorded in the centers. We've developed the capacities of, uh, we've trained some personnel from the Emirates, and we deployed computers so that these activities are easily analyzed. We also supported mediation activities in communities that are polarized, either based on religion or based on ethnicity. Such supports, we started in uh, Ole, Ole in Yola South local government between farmers and herders. We also did uh, that support in Guyuk between farmers as well and herders, uh, where there were agreement signing events where people, farmers agreed uh, times to farm and times to herd with herders. Um, we also supported the Adamawa state government in establishing the sexual assault referral center at the specialist hospital in Yola. Uh, the Adamawa Hope Center is a one-stop shop for clinical services, psychosocial support, as well as legal support where survivors of sexual and gender-based violence get treated there. We trained medical doctors from the specialist hospital to man the place, nurses as well as counselors from the Ministry of Women Affairs. Uh, and we've been uh, providing drugs and other consumables at the center since 2018. The MCN program also supported women associations in some local governments like Michika and Gombi, and uh, they, we have supported them with grants. 30,000 Naira were given to 200 women in each of the local government to build back their life. And uh, 
the MCN program also supported initiatives uh, in Maiha, Youth in Peace Building Initiative in Maiha, where uh, a kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer education was done, was carried out in Maiha, and there are a lot of groups, peace ambassadors in the community where they carry out sensitization activities against drug abuse, against other forms of violence in our communities. The MCN program also supported voluntary policing sector, the VPS groups, that's the Hunters Association and the Vigilante groups of Nigeria in six local government areas with capacity building. We brought them to Yola, uh, trained them on human rights, uh, on uh, Nigerian legislation, legal system, as well as how to how to relate with the formal security sector. Uh, we also supported them. They went back and did step down. They tr we supported them with tools, working tools. So when, okay, the final one is the research part that the MCN program uh, supported. We engaged the Center for Peace and Security Studies of the Mautec. Uh, they did a research on conflicts around land and water and uh, uh, the outcome was shared by, to the government as well as uh, security agencies. Part of what we are doing is, okay, when the COVID-19 came, the program decided to support the spread of the, uh, of the uh, pandemic. And uh, doing that, we supported all district heads in Adama State. 104 district heads, as well as all first class chiefs with hand washing facilities, face mask, and uh, personal protective equipment. We also supported the center, uh, the SAC, the Adama Hub Center, with protective equipment to protect the staff against this, uh, the pandemic. The program also supported the vigilante, the VPS groups with first marks and Kekena Paper Association. We also supported Christian Association of Nigeria and the Muslim Council with IEC materials against COVID-19. So we decided, okay, we, we have seen some, some women associations carry out this uh, uh, campaign in some communities and we've seen the impact. We decided to, okay, let us get a civil society organization to carry out this awareness raising in our communities through women groups and youths. And uh, we, we are all aware of the uh, security issues posed by the Sheila group. And uh, okay, we said humanitarian innovation hub should take this. They were carefully selected based on their experience in working around humanitarian and development activities in Adama State. So I want to assure everybody here that uh, they are capable and we believe they will deliver. And uh, we'll work hand in hand to see that this is the deliverables are delivered and it is achieved. The, finally, the doctor. Thank you so much. British Council Humanitarian Innovation Centers, youth leaders, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the press. As rightly pointed out by the MC, uh, the present day government of uh, Right, Honorable Ahmadou Morif Intri has carved out a ministry purposely for the development of entrepreneurship. Uh, this ministry is saddled with the responsibility of training on skills acquisition, both technical and agro-based. And the main ministry has the responsibility of carrying out 
and regulating cooperative societies. All types of cooperative societies we are based under this ministry. And I have the privilege to be the director in charge of the regulations of cooperatives and their registrations. As rightly mentioned, we have technical skill acquisition centers across the states and farming skill acquisition centers where we partner with development partners to carry out trainings, both technical and agro, on all aspects of entrepreneurship development and human development in those centers. Likewise, we developed and trained cooperative societies on the rigors of group dynamics, bookkeeping, and business plan development. In order to do that, we have offices and officers on ground in all the 21 local governments of Adamawa State so that the work can be easy in every locations and their officers to nurture and nurture those groups that are within those locations. As these programs mainly concern with the development of youth, both women and boys, We will say that we have such groups of youths who are already organized in the 21 local governments. Over 250 of such groups are already in existence, fully registered with their structures on ground. Using this group for any other particular purpose, will help a lot for any development partners to achieve the desired results. In the past, we have cause to celebrate on certain programs that have been carried out by development partners like the UNDP, the European Union, Mexico, and a host of others. We are Youth groups we are empowered through the VHSL SA, that's the village and savings loans groups where entrepreneurs were developed and capitals were given. Presently, with the situation, the security challenges that is going on in every nook and cranny of the state. Uh, my ministry have developed a template where we have already started implementing that we have started developing vigilante cooperatives in most of those flashpoints in the state where the communities were involved in forming their vigilante group, which we gave registration. So we are using the cooperatives as a vehicle to checkmate uh, the securities within the wards and estates in the state, and also to use the cooperatives as a vehicle for youth development in entrepreneurship and skill acquisition. In a short note, that's the lead to that uh, my ministry is carrying on. Once again, I thank you on behalf of my honorable commissioner, Mr. James Ilya, for giving us this privilege. Thank you already established protocol. Um, where did I go start? We are all, um, we've heard about COVID-19 and um, we've seen the impact. And I hope to maybe throw more light and take your questions, debunk some of the myths you have already, and if possible, throw more light on some things you don't know. When people say coronavirus, 
we actually have to be specific because there are seven different types of coronavirus or viruses. But the, sorry, <laughs> but um, the coronavirus we refer to is the SARS-CoV-2, which is um, the virus that um, produces or manifests as COVID-19. Now, it started, um, well, we got to know about it in December last year, 2019, started in Wuhan, China, before it came down to Nigeria, and after a while, it was made known as a public health emergency of international importance. Now, let's not talk too much about that. What are the symptoms of COVID-19? Before I even continue, I'm hoping it's interactive. I'm hoping you, um, I could talk to you and ask you questions and you answer or, you know, just help a sister out. Okay, so now, what are the symptoms of COVID-19? We have um, cough. <laughs> yes, please. High fever, that's um, a fever of uh, more than 38 degrees centigrade. So when we do the t um, temperature checks, that's what we're looking for. You also have breathlessness. You have, uh, yes, anosmia. Um, anosmia is loss of um, sense of smell. It's also loss of um, taste too. Then some people can also present with lethargy, where they are easily tired. They've had um, uncommon symptoms of um, this um, color discolorations of fingernails. Um, appearance of mold on the body, and then when you, when you see now, when you check, the person has COVID-19. Now, how is this spread? Don't forget that the topic of discussion is the challenges of COVID-19. So while I discuss, it's a discussion, while I talk about it, I'll also bring out or draw out the complications, the challenges we've experienced in the field in treating or managing COVID-19, or even the perception of COVID-19. Okay, so now, let's go back to, we started with the symptoms. One challenge in, as a medical doctor, in seeing symptoms is the fact that COVID-19 could present, could be seen in people, who, first of all, who are asymptomatic and actually don't even have symptoms. And another thing again is the fact that it could mimic other diseases. We talked about loss of taste, that was an example. Fever, um, lethargy, joint pains. You know, I've just given you what someone presents in the hospital and we say, oh, maybe it is malaria. But then again, COVID-19 has these symptoms. So now that's another challenge. But then how do we know it's COVID-19? Most times when we see something like, when we see cases like that, or we see the three distinguishing symptoms characteristic for COVID-19, we say it is maybe, it is probably a suspected case of COVID-19. And this, these three are fever, that's having a temperature of um, 38, more, 38 or more, 38 degrees centigrade or more. The presence of that cough can't be ruled out since COVID-19 is a respiratory ailment. So every other respiratory symptoms could be part of, or rather are part of the definition or the symptoms associated with COVID-19. Now that's that. I've said one challenge. Now, how is COVID-19 transmitted? He gave me the mic, right? Now, this is, um, I don't know, I'm just um, almost obsessed now with, I have to use the hand sanitizer to, you know, that's another form of transmission, but that's not the main form of transmission. The main form of transmission is actually through the respiratory droplets. And that is why we're all wearing face masks, or should be wearing face masks correctly, but most people aren't here. So remember, transmission one, through respiratory droplets. And secondly, how does this work? I'm wearing a face mask, I'm speaking, I'm talking. I'm talking about wearing a face mask. The, what I would have been expelling or the, the saliva that would have opened up my mouth could have even reached the door without really want anyone really knowing. That's why most times they say a distance of two meters at least. 
Now, that is one, respiratory droplets. Now, these respiratory droplets, hmm, I'm wearing my glasses, you see people wearing face shields, is because transmission is not just, yes, respiratory droplets, but through the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. That is one, or oh, that is two. Another thing again is that these droplets can be seen on surfaces. So let's say I cough or I sneeze, and then it just falls off. Or, sorry, MC, I'm going to talk about it. He's talking, his saliva is everywhere on this mic, and you know, I'm going to touch it, touch my face, touch my eyes. And of course, that is it. So now, we've talked about the first challenge, and in this, this is another challenge we have. We can't be as principled, or we, can't, we are not able to correctly follow IPC measures, and that is the infection prevention and control measures that is expected of us, of individuals. Now, so we've talked about symptoms, we've talked about transmission, we've talked about the cause, which is the COVID or the coronavirus. Now, treatment. In the course of these treatments, there are really no medication per se for COVID-19. But then everybody has, um, no, rather not everybody, but most people have come up with a vaccine or medications that has not been proven to be effective in the treatment of COVID-19. That's one. The challenges we faced in Adamawa State are such that people even here in this hall don't understand the gravity of COVID-19. Or maybe they do, but have not had experiences maybe having a loved one die from COVID-19, or even they themselves having the experience of it. Because you can imagine if someone presents an elderly person who already has other comorbidities, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, or even an asthmatic patient comes down with COVID-19. The effect, it will, the way of manifestation in that person will be different from that in an individual, or rather in younger people, like us, who would most likely come down with that disease. But then most people don't understand that. They just come, do what they wish, and they go. And that's another challenge we face. In Adamawa State, we've had, uh, we've had about um, 248 positives out of the 2,000, about 2,500 samples that were collected. That is actually very poor as compared to other states. And then it doesn't mean that that is the actual number of people that have come down with that disease in Adamawa State. The challenges we faced as an EOC, which is a part of it, is that people don't even understand the gravity. I've said that before. And they keep taking chances. Even here, here I said something about people think um, it has waned or it's no, more, it's no longer in existence. But the truth is that it is in existence. And we're expecting, a, is it the second or even the third floor floor, where there's going to be an increase and we most likely would have maybe more, death, more, more cases of death or even affectation. That's another thing. Then what else do we face? We have um, people's perception of it. Stigmatization also plays another role. It's also a challenge we have to come up with as an organization or as the EOC. You have somebody telling you, I'm going to give you a case scenario and then we'll discuss from there. I come here today and um, it turns out that maybe in two, three, four, five days, I come down with um, COVID, COVID-19. What is expected is that they would come and do contact tracing. And when they come, well, there's um, social distancing that is um, well kept. They would expect me to give them a list of my contacts. I came in contact with uh, my neighbor here. I've come in contact with the MC. I've gone to have um, breakfast. No, they would expect me to come back and write a list of everybody in this hall, maybe except if I don't really, or didn't come in contact with. Now, the challenge comes when they call and say, Onome came down with COVID-19. If they call some of you, Come, let's take samples from you. Most people might not want to take samples. Why is that? I really do. Okay, I know the reason, but why? 
It's pretty easy in the state. The, the, governor, uh, the state government, the partners, have done it so well that I had friends who turned out positive some time ago in, um, fair, no, in June. Some of them were upset, ah, but when they got there, they feed them better than how they feed at home. They always have light. Imagine they take, um, they give them juice, they, sorry, I'm talking about food, but then it was a good thing, or it is a good thing. And then now my colleagues want to, it's like, they want to have COVID-19. I too want to get, well, not really. But you know this, um, I'm getting two weeks break, um, two weeks off, like two weeks paid leave. You know how it sounds? You go, you watch TV, you're just staying at home, and you're resting. And that's the good thing about the new measures we put in place, wherein we can have home treatment. So please, if anything ever happens and they say one or two people came down with the disease, go for testing. I wouldn't expect, please. Yes. I cannot say for sure whether that is true or not, but I do not think so. Yes, the batches, the batches um, we've had so far has been good. And then if they tell you you're positive, it really doesn't make any difference. Because now it's going to be like malaria. I can tell you I had malaria yesterday. Time will come and I'll tell you I was positive for COVID two weeks ago, but I'm good now. We move, like, that's just how it is. So if you can, I'll make a suggestion that as, organi as, an, as an organization, if you can, test everybody. If you're positive, it doesn't really make any difference, really. You're doing that, you're being tested so that you can prevent your parents at home, you can prevent, you can protect people who are at risk of getting it and having a difficult or a different outcome from yours. So take for example, if I had eight parents at home, or I've lived with eight parents at home, and um, let's say my mom is asthmatic, or my dad has um, hypertension or diabetes, you know, as a young person, or as a younger person, my immune system is stronger than theirs, so it's easy for it to, for the COVID to come and go without me presenting symptoms. But then, for my parents who have those, pre -com um, those comorbid conditions, it's going to be worse on them. So we do things, we wear face masks, we follow the IPC measures, we wash our hands frequently, we protect ourselves. I say maybe you are from the same family. But we do these things to protect the people we love. That's actually why we do these things. So, yeah, I don't know if I've said or I've answered the questions. Yes, since um, there are partners here and since I'm in the committee, I am always pleased to talk about challenges we face in Adamawa State or we face in the EOC. We've had, um, first of all, as a healthcare provider, we've had shortages of personal protective equipment, that's PPEs. There's a time when people, not necessarily me, well, had to wash or reuse face mask. So you can imagine how we were trying to protect ourselves, but then we're also coming down with this disease because it's not enough. You can imagine that a pack of face mask earlier was 15,000 naira. How many will you go through in a day or in a week? How many, people can, how many people can afford that? How many facilities can afford that? So that was a challenge. That is still a challenge in some facilities. So you can see that maybe you see a doctor or a healthcare worker, when you go to the hospital where you're supposed to get better, you go to the hospital and then you come down worse than you went, or you come down with COVID-19. These are some of the challenges we face then. Then, what else? I can't even it off my head. Okay, yes, back to the example where I talk about um, positive. When I come here, they tell you, an the was positive for this. When they tell you this, please, Take your, let them take your sample. When you take your sample, you have the option of being treated at home if you stay alone and won't infect another person. That is one. We have, and there's another option of going to the treatment center. We have two treatment centers. We have one in specialist hospital and another in federal, federal medical center. So please, and they've been fitted for your comfort for any other person's comfort. 
So you you're not leaving your house and thinking you're going to suffer somewhere else, or there won't be light, or there won't be giant ones like 24-7, the feeding is good. And at a point, they were even giving them 20,000 for coming to the hospital. So you can imagine, it's been good. But all this was so that we can stop transmission. We can stop the spread. Once we understand that, I think we will have less cases of COVID-19. And please, that our values are very low doesn't mean it's not there. It's been said that if you count for every 10 person in a gathering, for, for every 10 people in a gathering, at least one person is positive. So if we are 100 here, there are 10 positives. No, that's the truth, so we just need to be careful. I don't know, I think I'm done. Okay, please, sorry. Yes, I can. Good morning, doctor. Um, I just want to ask, a pandemic is, a pandemic is classified by the World Health Organization as an epidemic occurring worldwide or over a very wide area, crossing international boundaries and usually affecting large number of people, and also with a mortality rate that is high. So if we look at influenza, it's a mortality rate of 0 0.01 to 0 0.03. So I want clarification on why is it COVID-19 so dangerous against malaria, TB, diabetics, and SARS? Why, is, why do we call this a pandemic, and why do we have to take the precautions that, ha that we are taking? Okay. One, from your definition, it's um, about the pandemic. It had international proportion. That is one. And then that's also because of the rate of um, transmission. It's not the same thing as malaria. Malaria is transmitted through the mosquito bite, plasmodiasis. That's what gets malaria. But then, if I'm positive and I shake his hands and he puts it in his eyes and his immune system is already low, then he has a higher chance of getting COVID-19 than you seated across from me and I'm just talking to you. Now, between both of us, it's less than a meter, or less than two meters. And if I was wearing my face mask and I was positive, I would just be pouring it on him. Now, even with the face mask, it reduces transmission. It doesn't prevent it. I hope you understand that. Because some people will tell you, I've been wearing face mask and I'm not supposed to come down with it. No, it only reduces it. It's not an N95. It's not even a respiratory. It only just prevents it. And then most people don't even wear it correctly. They wear it and you see, they, because they can't breathe properly, they'll leave their nose, nose fields open. But then they forget that the transmission is through respiratory droplets. And then it's passing through the mucous membrane. And then the difference between the eyes and the nose is that the mucous membrane for in the nose is small or larger than that in the eyes. So most people just cover their mouths. What are you doing? You're only, you're only helping us. If I cover my mouth and remove my nose, you're not going to transmit it, or rather you're going to reduce transmission, but then you'll take in everything. You see how it works. Any other questions? Um, thank you for the enlightenment, doctor. Um, I'd like to ask a question as regards um, those that have or are prone to upper respiratory illness. Um, for instance, asthma. So you're using the mask in a bit to protect yourself from COVID and you may end up having a crisis from breathing. Now, what would such a person do? That's because, well, um, my daughter um, is, has a similar case. Then also to add to um, the situation or when we're talking about the testing, why some people shy away from it, I think like every other thing we have in Nigeria, we can't um, disassociate corruption with the fact that people don't want to be tested. Now, it's not in a Damawa state, but there's a state in Nigeria where most of their workers have to be tested before they go back to field. Most of the health workers, apologies to your industry, but most of the health workers manipulate the results so that they can get 
um, financial um, incentives from these workers because they know they can afford it. Now, if we look at our borders as well, how effective is our monitoring? I have a family friend that came in from a country that has a high rate of COVID and her passport wasn't taken away from her. She was allowed to travel back home with the instruction to go back for testing after seven or 14 days. Now, what if she already has COVID? How can we effectively monitor that others around her are not at risk? So I think um, most times it even goes beyond the stigma. But as I said, like every other thing with our dear country, we can't disassociate corruption. Ask me three questions, so I would um, answer them. Without, um, without the or with the fear of being quoted, in the case of um, COVID versus asthma, I think for me I'll pick the bigger devil or the lesser devil. It's like being struck between the what was that word they said, the deep blue sea and a hard rock or something like that. The point is, yes, devil. You have to pick what will. Um, you have to pick your poison. What I mean by that <laughs> is we've had cases like that. But when they say IPC, infection prevention and control, you have to individualize it. One of the things is minimize gatherings, avoid crowds and gatherings as much as possible. If she's not in this setting, she doesn't have to wear a face mask. If she's not coming in contact with other people or people who haven't been in her own space, for 14 days or in 14 days, then she doesn't have to wear a face mask. I'm sure she doesn't wear a face mask at home. Yes, school has resumed, that is one. Now, the issue is, what do we do? Stop her from going to school? We can't do that. But then there's a virus. We can build her immune system, feed her more so that she has less chances of being infected. And then even if she's infected, she can fight it when she has it or if she gets it. Are we good on that point? Okay, now that's one. Then um, about um, healthcare workers manipulating results. It's been such that, um, anyway, I'll speak for Adamawa State because I am in Adamawa State. I'm actually even in the EOC, so I know what happens. It's almost unlikely for this it is unlikely for these results to be falsified because it is being triple checked by three different sets of people. We run an IMS system where there's the IMS incident manager with eight pillars, risk assessment, lab surveillance, point of entry. I'm in point of entry, so I'm able to answer your last question about borders. But now as concerns this, one of our challenges, actually, in Adama State is funding for healthcare workers. We don't need to, they don't need to falsify results. COVID-19 has been here for going on six, seven months. They need to be paid. They will be paid, whether they are positive cases or not. They are going to run samples. That is those in the lab now would run samples. For them to run some, for them to come to work, and run samples, you need to pay them. The people giving them the sample are sample collectors. They will do their jobs, bring it to them. Those running the samples will run samples. Those verifying will verify. We have NCDC in our midst. So it's unlikely for people in Adamawa State to falsify results. Because, and it's not even because about corruption or so, they just can't do it. And even if they did it, even if you see there are 1,000 cases. It doesn't add money to anybody's pocket. It doesn't do that. What they only do is they'll find the person, that, the people that are positive, mob them up, and either take them to isolation center or start treatment. So please let's dissuade that this is about corruption, at least for Adamawa State or in Adamawa State. The corruption you'll be thinking of, if, if there's even anything, is procurement, in procurement maybe. Procurement of face masks, procurement of that's where you can see. But talking about falsifying results, 
that's almost impossible. Please, almost impossible. About point of entry, that's your last question. Well, a challenge we face or we have is manpower. How many people are you going to keep at the borders? How many people will look to take, um, to take their BPM, sorry, to screen them? If they're not on a positive, what are you going to do? I'm in point of entry, we see patients, when they were, for every entry, when we stop people at the airport, we we'll only tell you the next person because we pass it on. This person turned out positive, the person will do their job. So if someone else doesn't do his job, you can't really blame the next person or say, there's a, or say the system is faulty. Maybe yes, the system is faulty, but at that point, what? We're taking corrections, we're hoping to do better. Initially, what, when it happened, I don't know, maybe a month ago, things that used to happen a month ago, it's not the same thing that's happening now. We grow and we learn from experience. I hope that answered your questions. All right. Okay? Sorry, I'm not giving you my mic. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my question is, um, I've been wondering, I mean, when the whole pandemic started, activities have been less, like going to offices and what have you. And I'm going to talk, uh, talk based on what is happening in Nigeria. So, I mean, now that people have resumed work, social gatherings have been resumed and what have you, but still, there are no higher high cases of coronavirus in Nigeria. So that's kind of puzzling. So I want to know what is happening. And also, beside that, um, what do you think about the air doctor tag that our politi politicians carry around? How effective is that? Does that really stop someone from getting coronavirus? Thank you. I'll answer the question. Um, about the air doctor, what it does is that it just releases chemicals that um, they say kills the virus before it comes out or before it um, is being transmitted. I, as a person, I don't believe it. Because if you, if you pay attention to transmission, respiratory droplets, you'd, um, you'd be talking and then it's flying everywhere. So what do you do? It's just there for you to, so what, have you, no, I don't really think it works. I, as a person, don't think it works. It might reduce it, but it doesn't stop transmission. Remember, even the face mask we're wearing doesn't stop, stop transmission, it only reduces it. Then about um, the low incident or the low cases in Nigeria, in Adamawa State, that is a big challenge for us. We've had, um, and please, um, I'm hoping we're having partners or people who will collaborate with the government or with the EOC of other member states to help cope or help um, solve this particular challenge. The people in the lab have not been paid for some time. And that is why our results are, seem, it's, that's why it seems as if we do not have cases. Imagine in, in Adamawa we had only 248 positives in let's say six months. Is that possible? It's, 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 um, it's not possible. It's not possible that those are the only positives in the state. So that is a challenge we faced. And then we are, we're hoping, we're praying that um, when we come to organizations like this, or when we tell people, in your organization, for, for example, when we say you work in um, YEDC, we hope when you go to work, you can say, you can tell your director, let's all test our people for COVID-19. Is that what we expect for people to do before work starts? Or before they, you know? Or here, in the hub. That's all for COVID-19. We're open to that. If you tell me today you want to... Um, good afternoon. Um, my question is about getting reinfected once you've had coronavirus. Is that possible? Yes, it is. It's an ongoing study. It's a new disease. And, um, but as of last... Um, what we heard, it took take you about three weeks after resolution of symptoms and 
having a negative result for most people that like one can come down with a case of reinfection. So yes, it's possible for someone to be infected again with COVID-19. It doesn't give you immunity. Is that okay? All right. Any other questions? So do I go and sit down? All right, I think I'm done. I present to you Dr. Lionel von Frederick Rollins. I call him Dr. Lionheart. Thank you, Mr. MC. You make me look good. You make me look like um, some superstar, some entertainer, or something like that. But I like it. And when you go back, sir, tell me a, a, a title. Which one will you give me? Delta? Delqua. Del what does that mean? It she. she. Like a female she? she. Or oh, shield. I'll take that. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, um, all the distinguished people gathered here. I have a few slides. There's not many, and I'm going to try not to bore you, but I have a lot of good information to give you and to pass on to you. Is this working, sir? And I'll be talking about the Schiller boys and how it has become a public health nuisance to all of us here. Now, you may want to know how do, how, what qualifies me to talk to the Schiller boys or about them is because I know them. I meet them. I met them. I, I know them. I know who they are. They know who I am. There are times, uh, once or twice, I would see one or two of them arrested. And the next day, I'm in the market and they, they're waving at me saying hello. But yesterday, I saw them at the police station. Today, he's waving and calling me, Bature, how are you? So, so, many of you may not be able to see it all the way from the back, but this man, his name is C. Everett Coop. He was a U.S. Surgeon General who 30 years ago determined that crime and violence is a public health issue. The problem was, at that time, no one in the world ever thought about that. They thought crime was something else. He figured out that crime is a public health issue, and as a result of that, it started a brainstorm, and everybody all over the world were arguing, until... The World Health Organization signed on and agreed with him that crime and violence is a public health issue. And I'll show that to you in a few slides. The belief in the past was that crime and violence was the responsibility of the police and the criminal justice system because it focused on punishing criminals and not rehabilitating criminals. And that is the result of what we are dealing with now. In the past, the criminal justice system, their only belief and idea was to punish criminals. No rehabilitation. So a man goes to prison here in Yola, in Nigeria, anywhere, he spent 20 years, maybe 15. You do not treat him. You do not train him. You do not correct him. And he comes out 20 years later. What is he going to do? Let us assume he was a rapist. He went to prison for 20 years. What is he going to do when he gets out? He will rape again. So...
I'll give you a definition of violence, and you will see how it ties into the Schiller boys. Violence is described as the intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against oneself, suicide, another person, you, against a group or community which either results or has the high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, deprivation, and so forth and so forth. And now, that brings us to the Schiller boys. I met some Schiller boys just yesterday. I decided, I told them, I'm going to give um, a talk about you. Is there anything you don't want me to say or anything you want me to say? If there's something you do not want me to divulge, tell me. They didn't care. Said, tell them what you want to tell them. They can't do us anything. They believe that they are invincible. They say, tell them anything, they can't do us anything. The Schiller boys, some of them are at the age of 10. But many of them, too, are in the late 20s. Some even in the early 30s. So do not think that it's some little kids you're dealing with only. I will show you a picture of a guy, a Schiller boy. You may not see it too clearly. His name is Cutter. Cutter. That's his nickname because he's the one who cuts you, who slices you. He's been doing that since he was eight years old. He's now about 15. 15, maybe 14. I don't even think he's 15. He's 14. And he has no problem cutting you. Cut your neck, cut your hand, cut your leg. He will do it because he's been doing it for years. And he has nothing to worry about. So, the Schiller boys, if you could have seen it properly, the Schiller boy, Cutter is in the middle. These are some Schiller boys who were arrested and were inside your compound, showing off their weapons. The Schiller boys, their violent activities are never random. They know exactly what they're doing, and it has become an epidemic. Their behavior is now an epidemic. We have a pandemic with COVID-19. Now we have an epidemic with the Schiller boys. And it's an epidemic because it spreads, it's been spreading, it clusters, and it is transmitted through exposure. And in red, the people of Yolanjimeta are now more afraid of the Schiller boys than they are of COVID-19. And COVID-19 is very, very real. The good doctor just told you. Mary told you. Everyone has told you. COVID-19 is very, very, very real. Yet, we are more afraid of the Schiller boys than we are of COVID-19. So... One of the questions somebody was asking me is um, earlier today, or they sent me a text, and they said, what has the Schiller boys, con have they contributed to COVID-19? Here in Adamawa, and the answer is yes, to an extent, but we don't know, because the one have collected data and have done any research, but we do know that they have. And how do they do that? Well, in two ways. They don't worry about social distancing. When they drive around in their KK, it'll be five, six of them, and they do what they want to do. Secondly, they do like to wear the mask. Why do you think they like to wear the mask? They disguise their face. No one can see them. So they do like to use the mask. They make him look responsible and make him look as if they're really taking the, 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 the COVID-19 seriously. But what it has done was they are no longer worried about just attacking you from the KK. They're now breaking into your homes 
And that started when the lockdown began and most people could not go out. It, remember that. When the lockdown began and most people stayed at home, that is when they changed their tactics and started robbing compounds. And they told me that robbing compounds is sweeter and easier than robbing you in a KK. Because if they rob you in a KK, all they're getting is your cell phone, maybe your purse, maybe a few change. But when they break into your compound, they're taking your TV, your jewelry, or your cell phone, all your wife's cell phones. If you have good clothes, good shoes, they take them too. Everything. What blows my mind is, now, okay, let me go back. In Osney, there's a, 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 right across from Adam Mauer Hospital, there's a compound. They have 10, 10, peop, 10 homes in this one compound. They got robbed one night by the Schiller boys. And they called me to ask me to consult with me about what to do. I call all of those people in, they're stupid. They were a little upset. But I'll tell you what, maybe I should have used a lot softer words, but I was upset at them. Here is 10 homes. Each one of those homes had either two or three men who looked like us, looked like you men behind the cameras, in each home. So if you had two men in each home, and you have 10 homes, that's 20 men. Yet five Shiloh boys, five, went into that compound and went from house to house. Rob everybody in this house. Then they moved to that one and robbed everyone. Then they moved to the... What are you doing while these people are getting robbed? They were just sitting there. Waiting for their turn to get robbed. Five Schiller boys. Twenty able-bodied men. And they said, well, you know, they have machetes. And they said, don't you have machetes too? All of you, don't you have a signal? All of you living here, you have your wife and children. And you sit there, let five boys rob you like that. Then they say, oh, well, they have juju too. Say, well, why don't you get your own juju? Let juju fight juju. Or at the very least, if any of you live in, in a compound, if you have no security, get the people in each house, go and e each house, give two, three thousand naira at the end of the month, that's 30,000, and hire yourself some vigilantes or some private security to watch over you. But none of you, many of you will not do it because it's 2,000 Naira. But you forget that your iPhone is 300 and something thousand Naira. And when they steal it is when you say, ah. So folks, get smart, get wise, get ahead. All right, we'll talk about the Schiller boys and how do the activities become a public health. I don't know if you can see there, but those are Shiloh boys with machetes. It is tough. If they come up to in front of you and there's five of them and they put the machete there, they will strike you with it. They will. I know they've told me what they will do. So, if any Shiloh boy approach any one of you and they ask you for your cell phone, give it to them. Do not have a discussion. Give it. They will cut your hand off. Am I lying, madam? They will cut your face. Do not look into their eyes because they don't want you to recognize them. Look down. Humble yourself, no matter how big you are. Here, take the phone, take the watch, please. Otherwise, they will chop you. So, how do the activities of the Shilla boy affect our public health. Murder. 
The Shiloh boys are known to kill people. They have killed many others, and we have killed them too. It becomes an issue. They kill us when, they, when exactly, when we don't believe that the criminal justice system is helping us, we resort to jungle justice and we kill them. That cannot function well in, in a real supportive society. We cannot just walk around and kill each other. The other one is, is for me, is, is the most telling. Rape. The Shiller boys rape and rape mercilessly. One of the guys told me, he was, eight, he was 12 years old, he raped a woman in her compound and he had he H HIV. He said, how do you know that it is that woman who gave you HIV? He said, he, he's 12 years old, he had sex one time and one time only it was with that woman. Then he had HIV. He found out six months to a year later that he, he was HIV positive. So he made up his mind, every compound that he break into, he will rape someone in there to pass it on because he's very angry. This is the concept of these people. A public health issue, big. Pregnancy. If they rape you, there's a possibility you're gonna, you could get pregnant. And they have women who work with them now. We shouldn't even call it Shiller boys, because it could be Shiller boys and girls. They have some young, good-looking, fit, sexy-looking girls that you will never suspect is a Shiller girl who are prostituting themselves for the boys. And then when, they, when you go out with them, they set you up for you to get robbed right after you finish doing your stuff. I'll tell you about the pregnancy shortly. That happened to a young lady. Robbery. They'll break into your house. We spoke about that. They'll rob you in your KK. They'll rob you in here, out there, any way you can. Protect yourselves. This is not the time for Nigeria or anyone to go soft on crime. Your crime rate is escalating exponentially. And by the way, this has nothing to do with Shiller boys, but I'll tell you, we just disbanded SARS. I'm against it. I felt they should just reform them, train them, teach them, because you're going to just take these guys and they'll go somewhere else and do the same thing. Or if you bring new people and you didn't train them, what are you going to get? The same. So why not take them, train them? That's what they do all over the world. But now, if, if SARS has disappeared, you're going to see the go if nothing replaces them quickly. The Shiller boys, they're deathly afraid of SARS here in your land, Jumeta. They're deathly afraid because they know what SARS will do to them. So wherever they see SARS, if SARS is in the east, they go west. We need those kind of protection. Robbery. Suicide. And that is when I was talking about pregnancy. There's a young lady who killed herself not too long ago after she was raped and became pregnant by one of the guys who raped her. And the stigma that she got from her family, more so than anybody else, is the family because nobody knew that the girl was raped except the family. And the guy raped her in front of the father and the mother and everybody else. Nobody knew about it. The family released it and told people the girl went and killed herself. 16 years old. High blood pressure. If you are having some BP problems and uh, Shilla boys had um, a problem with you, your blood pressure will go up. And if it goes up, you have a problem. Fear of crime. The Shilla boys instill a fear of crime. The fear of crime is one of the greatest 
um, ills that we can have in any society, the fear of crime. Not the crime itself, just the fear of crime. We may think that you're afraid of a crocodile. We may think you're afraid of a snake. No. There are two things that people are afraid of, deadly afraid of, public speaking and the fear of crime. Every time, and I'll give you an example, all of you, whenever you're walking, going down a dark alley at night, what's the first thing come to your mind? Is that whether a snake or a crocodile is going to get you? Is it, is it somebody going to jump out at me? If you're a woman, you start thinking about rape. If you're a man, you start thinking about robbery. We all do. I'm not just invincible or feel invincible. If I walk down a dark street, I feel vulnerable, just like everyone else. Social isolation. If you are afraid of crime, you have a fear of crime, you will self-isolate. These are people who go home at 6 p.m. and stay at home. They don't go out. Social isolation also contributes to domestic violence. We know for a fact that when COVID-19 hit the world and everybody was shut down, we know domestic violence went up. Man and his wife just start beating each other. Even brothers and sisters were fighting. It's known. So when people self-isolate, the next thing happens is domestic violence. Drugs and alcohol. People turn to alcoholism and drugs to calm their nerves and the anxiety from a lack of sleep. The good doctor can attest to that, doctor. Isn't a lack of sleep contribute to ill health? There is a lot of studies now, and many people don't read into it, right there, Karen? Lack of sleep contributes to ill health. You really truly need to get a, 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 the specific amount of sleep. That's the eight hours, but try to get as much as you can. You do not make out yourself to be a real man if you say, ah, I only had three hours of sleep last night. Really? So, okay. So what does that make you? A big man? No, it makes you a sleepy man. Psychiatric mental illness post-traumatic stress disorder. The fear of crime, crime itself, contribute to mental illness. You break down, you, you have problems, you cannot function in society, and everything goes. And all of these are risk factors for an early death. Every one of them. Except murder, because you're already dead. All right. What should we do? I have a few things to give you of what we should do. This is an angry Shiller boy. I don't know if you, all, if you couldn't see it from there, but this, look at the size of that man. He doesn't look like a boy. He's a Shiller boy. He's about 30, in his 30s. Very strong. And he has a machete. And you have two um, SSS guys who are going to take him down. But that is very fearful. A man with a machete, an angry man who's probably on drugs and you have to confront him. You see why you shoot people, why the police shoot people? So what should we do? Communities living without adequate resources are those, and those facing unfair treatment are more susceptible to ill health issues, including violence. Any community that is treated poorly and don't have the natural resources or the environmental resources is going to have problems from health and violence. Violence itself should be seen as a social determinant. In other words, violence begets violence and exposure to violence is the greatest predictor of future violence. This is very important. Violence begets violence. 
Exposure to violence is the greatest predictor of future violence. If a child looks out his door, his window, and he sees people stabbing, shooting, beating people, he, at some point in his life, will do the same thing. Violence begets violence. And it's the same thing I said earlier. Uh, we, uh, the Shiller boys, attack us and kill us. When we get tired of it, we attack them and kill them. That is not good for a real proper functioning society. What should we do? Communities must address environmental factors that increase susceptibility to violence and decrease susceptibility. You have to give to take. And this comes from people like you, NGOs, all you people who work in with, with the youth, um, faith-based organizations, uh, civil society organizations. You all are the ones who have to go into those communities and fix it for them because they don't know how to. They don't know how to fix their problems. Communities must work to replace negative norms that encourage violence and replace it with positive norms. You get rid of the negative behaviors and attitudes, replace it with positive behaviors and attitudes. Community effort must also address environmental factors such as employment, education, ethnicity, tribalism, religion. You all know, by the way, gender equity is one of them. We have to talk about that because that is something not being practiced here. Something I, whenever I speak with certain big people, I ask them all the time, why is it, why is it you, when you pick up a youth off the street, the only thing you can teach him is how to make a shoe or handbag. Why is it the only thing he can do is, is a carpentry? You know, I, I'm a told you, I spoke to Sheila boys. They, want, they told me they want to be able to make websites. They want to get involved in computers. We think that they're dumb and they have no ambition. No. They want to do things. No, they can't read, but they have a desire. They may learn to read to get to where they want. But we are not giving them the real thing. Just give them some technology. Give them innovation. Give them the tools that they can need, that they can... Let me tell you about this guy, Cutter. Cutter used to be, before he joined the Schiller boys, he used to work at a car wash. He and his friends used to wash cars for a living. The, the borehole dried up. They went to the community leaders and asked them to fix the borehole and provide water for them so they can wash cars and they can make a living. Nothing was done. The next thing we know, they joined the Schiller boys. So don't turn your back on these things. I really truly believe that we should offer these young men good tools, technology. Teach them how to use a computer. Teach them how to fix a computer. Teach them how to build a, a website. You never know what you can get out of it. They're really, really doing well for themselves. And lastly, this is a picture of that guy that they burnt, I uh, think about a month ago, or a week, two weeks ago. That's a picture where somebody tried to cover They burned him to death in Jamaica. Violence prevention programs improve quality of life through accessible, high-quality health care, as well as school facilities. Healthcare, schooling, you give it to your community and you'll be saving a lot of problems. Grassroots mobilization of community members, grassroots, is also essential for improving health. By holding 
systems, organizations, accountable and changing social norms. These are things that we have to do. The grassroots people have to do that. And finally, it is critical that members of impacted communities include, to include NGOs and other civil society organization, be deeply involved in all aspects of development, implementation and evaluation of these programs, so you're going for yourself and your community. Thank you very much. If you have a question, I will take it. Now, C. Everett Coopers, you have to be over the age of 40 to know who he is. Because he was, 30 years ago, he was this, the, the, the Surgeon General when he made that statement. 30. So if you're 40 years old, you mean you're 10 then. And you, you probably weren't born at that time. Maybe you were born, but. Any questions, anyone? All right. We'll turn it over to the MC. You have, you, the MC, you're magnificent. Sorry. Oh, I know. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Um, this week, we did an outreach to the Jamaica Remand House. I was shocked to see that children were locked up in a concrete building, damp and dark, falling right. apart. And they stay there from six months to a year before they get uh, placed somewhere else. Now, if we don't take care of those kids, I would rather become a Sheila boy than sit there and nothing is done. So how do you think that this government, the local government, or even Jamaica and Yola governments can assist to prevent that? Because we can combine this. Children are locked up for stealing 500 Naira because they're hungry. So the alternative is Sheila Boy. Well, absolutely. You, 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 it's a good question and you answered it. Exactly. Why not become a Sheila Boy? And by the way, every one of us in here are only one click away from becoming a criminal. It is only the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Some of us are in good circumstance and so we are okay. But... If you were in certain circumstances, growing up in certain areas, you can virtually change and become something you didn't want to. I told you about Cutter, who was a car washer. He had no desire to be a Shiller boy. The borehole dried up. When the borehole dried up, no one fixed it. So what did he do to survive? He joined and became a Schiller boy. And by the way, to parents, I know a lot of you, you, you might not be old enough to have a child that big to join the Schiller boys yet. But if, if you are a parent, a mom or dad, you see a son who is only 12 years old, he has a phone bigger and better than yours. You're not gonna ask, son, where did you get that phone? He's wearing a pair of shoes that you can't afford to buy. He's 10 years old. Don't you want to know where he got those shoes? It's 10 o'clock at night, and your 10-year-old son is missing. Don't you want to know where he is? Ah, so, parents. I'm going to put some of that blame on you. All right, anybody else? Mr. Bapulo. Good afternoon once again. Um, uh, my question is, I mean, Dr. Yo, so conversant with the security um, challenges that uh, is bedeviling this um, state, and I wouldn't say I'm sure you know the leaders of the Sheila boys because of the intelligence you use, but assuming you know them, I mean, um, how do you think you can advise the state government to actually engage with them one-on-one -on -one and speak to them and ask them what do they really want and what, why are they doing what they are doing? And also, maybe the state government can also have 
a counseling agency or mental health um, facility where um, if they are caught, they can be taken there to examine their mental health, which might be caused as a result of abuse of drugs and what have you. And also, um, I want to suggest that as parents and elders who actually have younger brothers and sisters at home, I mean, a lot of them nowadays, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the close, closing of school, a lot of them have been idle, doing nothing. So many of them got themselves engaged in drug abuse and taking off um, um, substances um, to actually keep themselves busy to, or to take care of and, uh, a form of anxiety. So I want to suggest that as parents, a lot of you might not know that your ward is actually taking something until when it gets, gets worse and the safe prevention is better than care. Um, recently, um, what I did with my kid brothers is to actually surprise them by taking them for a medical test, a general medical test, and where I asked the doctor to actually take their um, um, urine sample to check for any drugs and also their blood. And to our surprise, I mean, some of them are actually um, taking drugs, taking marijuana and, and diazepam. So, but we, we, we didn't actually know that they are doing that because it doesn't look obvious on them. And I mean, if we can be doing this as parents, I think it will help reduce or curtail um, drug abuse, which ultimately lead to all this kind of menace, chiller boys, stealing and what have you, because they will actually have to get money to buy those. And if they don't have the money, they have to steal. So uh, that's my suggestion. Thank you. Uh, this is not bad at all. Good. It's a good synopsis you did. Listen, if you are a parent and you keep defending the bad behavior of your child, 10 years later, you'll be defending his bad behavior in a court of law for a crime he committed or crimes he committed. Think about that. If you defend the bad behavior of your child 10 years from now, you'll be paying a lawyer to defend that child for crimes that he committed because he's going to be depending on you at all times. I've met some of these, the, the Shilla boys. The Shilla boys are many, and they have several leaders. They have one big leader. And then he, others from the regions, report to him. It is an organized system, folks. It ain't the little boys like you imagined 10 years ago. They are very well organized. They have a hierarchy. One big man, and under him, is 20 big men. And under those 20 big men, uh, about 20 or 30, you know, lieutenants. And under them are the, the laborers. We do ask them, why are you doing what you do? And every answer is the same. We do it because there's nothing for us to do. And we want to make money. Okay. Here's the problem. Once you get the taste of blood, there's some animals that say they want more blood. So the problem is that you take a 10-year-old boy and he goes out with a bunch of guys, five guys. If he stole one iPhone, that's worth 300,000. One. Out of those five guys, he can get about 30,000, 40,000 a piece. The rest goes to the guys at the top. If you're 10 years old and you can make 30,000 or 40,000 a night, ah, you cannot take that away from him again. It's difficult to talk to him and say, stop doing that. Here, go, 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 go work for, for, for top 10 and make. And you get. Uh, you know, 2,000 a, a month. How are you going to do that? They already tasted blood. They know what it is to make money. Your current, I don't want to get political, but your current 
governor and his administration are doing a lot. Are doing, they, they, they're asking the right questions and they want to do the right thing to make the Shiller boys thing go away. And they really are doing something about it. At least from what I know, they're trying to make sure that this work, because nobody wants to live with this under their, 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 their shoulder. So they're doing some good work. So support them in let's try to get rid of the Shiller boys once and for all. Yes, ma'am. One day we will get rid of the Shiller boys for real. One day. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rawlings. So um, my question is relating to what you would say a good approach will be to um, engage the community on how best to um, solve this challenge. Because while efforts are being made by security um, agencies, the um, state government, what can we do, one, to make our community safer? And uh, another thing that um, we are also trying to address with this um, challenge is to is, um, peace and justice. So we don't want a situation where we start having situations of jungle justice being served. While exactly. we want peaceful communities, we don't want um, situation to degenerate to the point where these boys are not given the opportunity for fair trial when caught in these acts. So how can we best communicate that to communities and then also ensure that security forces, um, um, be the police force, the vigilantes, or the civil defense or other um, um, non-armed um, security forces are well educated on how to address crime in communities and follow the due process for justice. Good one. Um, violence begets violence. We said it there earlier. We do not want the Shiller boys to go and kill people. And if we catch them, we don't want to go and burn them with tires. It makes us look barbaric. And it makes us look like, what kind of, what kind of civilization is that? But then you're going to just bring more and more violence. And more and more violence will bring more and more violence. So let's not do that. And if you know people who are doing it, tell them don't do it. Keeping workshops and seminars such as this is a good way to disseminate information. Bring in experts in different fields and let them talk about the different areas. Because, you know, some people call them town halls, some people call them whatever. But these kind of, 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 of venues, these, this is a mecca of information that people could walk away with. The good doctor gave a lot of good information. You should have been 100 people walking up with that information. Some good questions were asked to, to augment what was being said. People should be walking with this and passing it on to other people as well. If you live in a gated community, you're lucky. Depends on the gated, how gated it is. But if you live in an area compound, and the security is poor, and you know that there is either none to very little, you need to get together as a compound. And this is important, people. Get together as a compound and come up with a plan. What will, what will we do if five or ten Shilla boys enter a compound in the middle of the night? What will you do? A signal, a sign. Somebody got to do something. You got to stand up for your own. 20 men, five boys. You're telling me you can't come and stand in front of your house like this with a machete in your hand and look bad? Of course you can. Because criminals don't want problems. They do not want problems. If they saw that in this compound, they will leave and go to this one. You stood up for yours, they didn't. If there is lights in your compound, they will leave your compound alone because they, want, they don't want to be seen. This one is dark. They're going there. That's where they will hang out. So, either get yourself together 
Ask everyone in the compound, contribute 3,000 naira. And with that 3,000 naira a month, we will go hire some vigilantes. The fact that you have two people there with den guns is enough to deter the Shilla boys. They may still come, but there's a deterrence. They will rather go to someone that has nothing at all. This is very important. I know many of you live in compounds and you do not have any security. It is a disaster waiting to happen. My last story, I'm gonna, and then I'll wrap it up. There is one of a, it, it just happened to somebody at AUN. They live in a compound, no security. A family. This man walked in, or this, the, these guys walked in, tie up the security guard who was sleeping. He was sleeping. He, they tied him up. He didn't even know that he was being tied up. You all understand? <laughs> then they went in. They knock on the door, and there's... The lady said, who is it? They said, it is us, and we are coming in. Open the door. She says, no, you will not open. And they just, they're bold enough. They said, no, you will open this door. Because if we come in on our own, you're not going to like it. They look out the door, saw five guys. They opened the door. They went in. Robbed them clean. This just happened. The, one of the young sisters, they didn't go after the older women. And when I say older, the women living in the house were in their maybe late 20s, early 30s. They went to rape the 18 year old. The only thing that saved her was she was on a menstrual cycle, and the guy didn't do it. But he was angry at her for being on a menstrual cycle, so he beat her up. You're not dealing with people who are reasonable. They, they, they've gotten to the point where they think that nothing is going to happen, that they are invincible, that um, whatever you do, they will go to, they'll get arrested and two days later they'll be out. And that's a frustration for a lot of people. And why a lot of people don't go to the police and tell the police that these are the Shiller boys who robbed me because you arrest them the magistrate let him out. Two days later, he's, he's in your neighborhood. And he knows you're the one who turned on him. So, let us go out there. Let us be safe. Security is not just one man's business. and not my business. It's also your business. We can do it. Let us take this and put it and make this workshop. And make this project a lasting venture. Make it work. We can do it. Thank you very much. Mr. MC.